So, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Hao Tian Tang. I'm a third year PhD student at, at MIT, advised by Professor Song Han. Um, so today I'm very glad to introduce to you our latest research, Hodgespot's efficient point cloud inference engine. So this is a joint work with my collaborators, Zhi Jian, Xiu Yu, Yu Jun, and our advisor, Professor Song Han. Um, by the way, my collaborator, Xiu Yu, has just started his PhD at UC Berkeley. So big congratulations to Xiu Yu on his uh, new journey of his career. Uh, nowadays, point cloud data is almost everywhere, so you can find them on AR, VR glasses, on your iPhones, on autonomous driving vehicles, and on LiDAR mapping drones. So it is very crucial for us to perform 3D point cloud understanding uh, in the tasks related to autonomous driving, and it is very important for us to take efficiency into account because we only have very limited amount of computation resources. So there are a lot of very challenging tasks for us to perform. For example, the 3D semantic segmentation in which we have to assign a point-wise label to each of the points in the LiDAR scan. Um, we also perform 3D object detection, which is used to um, localize the um, foreground objects within the LiDAR scan. So this is very useful for multiple stages in the autonomous driving pipeline. We can also perform BEV map segmentation. So this is also widely used for the reconstruction of the HD map. Um, which is also very useful uh, if you consider the car driving in the rural area where there is no like um, GPS signal or the uh, Wi-Fi signal. So nowadays people are tending to use the 3D sparse CNNs to process the point cloud data. So despite the fact that the 3D sparse CNNs are really strong in terms of the performance, so you can see that they have 3% higher accuracy with uh, merely a one-tenth of the computation overhead compared with the 2D solution, However, we can notice that they are actually measured to be 1.4 times slower on the conventional GPU devices. So if we look at the major computation in the 3D sparse DNNs, we are able to see that um, actually there is one operation called sparse convolution that is uh, dominating the computation flow. So the, uh, the sparse convolution is actually stemmed from the conventional convolution, and the idea is that it wants to um, skip all the computation on those regions where the output is um, bounded to be zero, so basically uh, it wants to keep the sparsity of the input and output to be exactly the same and skip those computations um, where there's no input activations. So uh, we found that actually sparse convolution is an operation that is bottlenecked by the, by the data movement operations and also mapping operations which is used to define the rule of computation because this is uh, uh, ultimately a sparse computation pattern. So um, we, we know that this uh, fact is due to the fact that the point cloud data is actually sparse and irregular, so we have to spend 40% to 50% of total runtime uh, on structuring the data and uh, try to define the rule of the computation. So in this paper, we actually focus on two important principles. Basically, we want to trade computation for regularity, and we want to reduce the memory footprint of the sparse convolution computation. So with these optimizations, we are able to achieve 1.7 to two times speed up over the baseline implementation. So to understand how we perform these optimizations, we have to look at the definition and also the existing implementation of the sparse convolution operator on the general purpose GPUs. So basically sparse convolution is defined as a sparse set of dense matrix multiplication and accumulation. So because this is sparse com computation, we have to define the rule of computation using a data structure called the map. So the map is actually a collection of three tuples. Um, for each tuple, there are three elements, um, input, output, and the weight. These three elements are all indices um, to like index the points or um, the weight matrices. So for each of these um, three tuples, it actually indicates the computation pattern um, of like we first fetch the feature from F in and multiply it with the weight W weight and scatter at the result to F out. So for each of the um, map, we, we will perform this kind of computation and this forms the um, final computation flow for the entire sparse convolution. So if we compare the computation flow of sparse convolution and the dense convolution, we can find that actually for the first four positions, there are no computation for the sparse convolution, but there are always dense matrix multiplication for the conventional convolution. But for the fifth position, because the input and outputs are both activated for the sparse convolution, we do have the matrix multiplication for um, both sides. 
And for the subsequent three positions, there are no computation for the sparse convolution and still dense matrix multiplication for the conventional convolution. And for the final um, position, because uh, we do have uh, activations for both input and output, we perform a uh, computation for both. So there are in total nine matrix multiplication operations for the uh, uh, conventional convolution, but there are only two computations for the sparse convolution. So for the existing GPU implementation, uh, in short, they are taking a uh, weight stationary data flow and try to group the computation for each weight together and um, separately perform matrix multiplication for different weights. So if we look at the first weight, we are able to see that um, because there are two map entries, so we just gather these two input features, P0 and P3, multiply it with the first weight, and scatter out the results to the corresponding output positions specified in the map, which is Q1 and Q4. So this is very similar for the second weight. And for the third weight, which is uh, W00, uh, W00, we can see that actually because all the entries in the input appears in the map, we, we don't have to perform the uh, gather and scatter operations. Instead, we directly do the uh, dense matrix multiplication. So uh, it is also similar for weight um, one zero. So this is just interchanging the uh, input and output of the weight minus one zero and similar for weight one one. So, okay, we have an overview of the uh, idea of how the sparse convolution is computed and how it is implemented uh, on the GPU. So now we're gonna pr uh, provide an overview of our torch sparse system. So um, in, in general, our system actually shares a very similar API interface um, comparing with PyTorch. So the users are able to compose their customized um, point cloud networks with our API such as uh, spn.com3d. And everything below this abstraction layer is wrapped up as a CUDA extension in the PyTorch framework. So basically our API is uh, very, very familiar to people uh, that, that are used to PyTorch. So you just need to uh, switch from nn.com2d to spn.com3d in our library, and you are able to perform um, the inference on the point cloud data instead of the uh, dense image matrices. So um, for our optimization, we are actually focused on two aspects uh, I mentioned previously. So the first one is the optimization on matrix multiplication. Basically, we want to trade computation for regularity and improve the device utilization via the adaptive grouping algorithm. And for the data movement, we actually um, try to bring down the cost of um, data orchestration using fuse and locality aware memory access. So first, for the optimizations on matrix multiplication, um, our observation is that for the separate computation baseline, which I just de described in the waste stationary order, um, the problem is that it has a lot of kernel costs. So basically for a 3D kernel of size three, we have like 20, uh, 27 positions um, for the kernel offset. And this means that we have to launch 27 uh, matrix multiplication kernels, and this usually leads to very low device utilization and very poor computation regularity. But the good thing is that actually this kind of implementation has um, zero computation overhead. That is because we do not do any kind of padding um, to um, perform the computation. The most straightforward way for us to increase the device utilization or improve the uh, regularity of computation is actually to batch the computation together. However, in this case, um, this actually makes the computation becomes exactly the dense convolution. So uh, as you might imagine, the computation overhead can be actually very large, and this sometimes will overweigh the benefits of the increased computation regularity. So ideally, we want to find something in the middle. So basically, we want to balance the computation overhead and also the computation regularity to achieve a better efficiency. So the idea is that we want to div divide the computation for different weights into multiple groups. And within each group, if there is only one weight, we're going to perform the regular matrix multiplication. And if there is more than one weight, we just do the padding and perform the batch matrix multiplication. So not surprisingly, it turns out that if we increase the regularity, uh, this will give us some, some kind of benefit, um, uh, for example, from like 26 groups, which is the separate computation, to six, group, six groups. But if we further increase the computation regularity by adding more padding, we will see that the latency actually uh, will be hurted. That is because we have um, very large computation overhead. 
And we also notice that we have to have like different behavior for different data sets and different layers. So this actually um, makes it necessary for us to design adaptive strategies. So here is an example showing that, um, you know, we, we observe that the grouping strategy on new scenes data set is actually much more aggressive compared with the strategy on the semantic kitty data set. That is because new scenes LIDAR scans are collected with um, 32 being uh, Velodyne LIDAR sensors, while the semantic kitty data are using um, the 64 being LIDAR sensors. So the data on new scenes is much sparser. So if we want to have better device utilization, you have to have uh, more aggressive grouping strategies. So there are also some um, co quantitative results showing that our uh, adaptive grouping strategy compared with a fixed strategy for all the layers and data sets is actually more beneficial. So it is uh, probably more interesting on new things that we observe, um, you know, the, the T4 per second for the fixed grouping strategy is actually the best and much better than the uh, adaptive grouping strategy. But if you look at the latency, you, you will find out that the adaptive grouping is actually the best. The reason is that our adaptive strategy actually has um, lower computation overhead compared with like uh, a very uh, aggressive fixed grouping strategy. So um, that's all for the optimization on matrix modification, and I'm going to continue to talk about our optimizations of data movement. So recall that actually the data movement is the largest overhead in the sparse convolution computation. So it takes up to 43 to 47 percent of the total runtime uh, in both detection and segmentation perception models. So the most straightforward way for us to improve the efficiency of data movement is actually to quantize the input features. However, we, we notice that if we naively quantize the features from FP32 to FP16, we will only have 1.3 to 1.4 times speed up instead of close to two times speed up. So to solve this problem, we actually also vectorize the memory access. So the idea is just to combine two FP16 memory accesses together um, to a 32-bit memory access transaction. So in this case, we are able to reduce the number of CUDA memory transactions by 2x and achieve a close to theoretical 1.9 times speed up. And on top of that, we also notice that the waste stationary scatter gather pattern is actually not cache friendly. So basically, we notice that because of the fact that the um, the map for each weight is actually unique, so there are no duplicating uh, elements in the map. So basically, if you are iterating over the uh, map in the gathering phase, you will find that every time you are encountering a new input feature. So this means that you will have 0% of cache reuse. And this is also the case for the scattering phase. What makes things even worse is that actually the um, our maps are very large and our cache is not large enough. So it is not, not possible for us to store all the input features in the cache and reuse them for later weights. So basically the cache, uh, cache mit miss ratio is almost 100% for this um, scatter gather data flow in the waste station or water. So to solve this problem, uh, our solution is actually quite easy to understand. So we, we just want to change the order of memory access so we call this strategy fuse and locality or where scatter gather. So the idea is very simple. So um, the weight stationary data flow actually minimizes the uh, DRAM access to the weights. So if we want to minimize the DRAM access cost for the gathering phase, which is the access to the input buffers, we just want to take the input stationary order to uh, access the um, DRAM. And for the output uh, scattering, because this is accessing the output buffer, so our strategy will be to take the output stationary data flow to do that memory access. So basically, I will use the gather phase as, a, as an example. So basically, the first accesses to all the inputs are mandatory cache misses because we do, do not have anything in the cache. But for all the subsequent memory accesses, because we can store the um, already the, the feature read from the DRAM onto the on-chip storage, uh, that is either cache or register file, um, we are able to um, have the cache kit for all the subsequent memory accesses. And this is also the case for the scatter phase. So basically we have 100% hit after the um, first compiler release. So with this kind of optimization, compared with the uh, vanilla waste stationary data flow, we are able to achieve 1.3 to 1.4 times speed up on top of the um, very strong performance of vectorized and um, quantized memory access. So overall, it's like um, 2.7 uh, times speed up over the baseline implementation. 
So in terms of evaluation, we are trying to uh, compare our work with state-of-the-art inference engines on a very representative point called benchmarks and models. Um, so basically, we are able to achieve 1.5 to 1.6 times speed, speed up over Minkowski engine 0 0.4, uh, 0 0.5.4 and SPConf 1.2.1, uh, which are um, the state-of-the-art libraries at the time of submission. And I also want to emphasize that our performance is also very good on GTX 1080 Ti, which is a um, device in Pascal architecture without any tensor core support. So you can see that the speed up over the baseline is quite consistent um, with the speed up we achieved on those latest GPUs. So this actually means that our improvement does not come from the automatic improvement from the faster FP16 GDMM on the NVIDIA GPUs. So in conclusion, in this work, we are optimizing sparse convolution and emerging operation on the um, point cloud processing. And we trade computation for regularity, optimizing matrix multiplication in sparse convolution via adaptive grouping. We also reduce the memory footprint of sparse convolution using fuse and locality aware memory access. So our two optimizations can be enabled using very simple uh, API changes. So basically using torch sparse tune, you are able to have the adaptive grouping and um, using these three lines of code, you are able to see um, the effect of um, both uh, vectorized and quantized memory access and fuse and locality um, pattern in our system. So our code has been released on GitHub and we do have a project page which contains our paper for more details. So in the last, I have to mention that uh, we already extend the impact of Torch Spass from just an inference library to the full stack of efficient 3D perception for autonomous driving. So we designed efficient algorithms, including lightweight 3D neural networks, such as PVCNM, accepted three years ago at NeurIPS as, as a spotlight presentation. And we also proposed a solution to automatically design efficient point cloud neural networks, uh, which is called SPVNAS. Uh, accepted as EC ECCV 2020 and also IEEE transactions on pattern analysis and machine intelligence last year. And we also, uh, very recently, we designed a multi-task, multi-sensor fusion pipeline called BEV Fusion, which actually fuses the information from 3D sensors and camera sensors in the bird's eye view space. And this is the current incumbent, in incumbent state-of-the-art solution on the Waymo Open dataset for the 3D object detection task. And other than the algorithm innovations, we also have um, specialized hardware support for the point cloud operations, which is called point ACC or point cloud accelerator. So this paper has been accepted, accepted to micro 2021 for presentation. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your interest. Welcome to check out our project page and the GitHub code release. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So um, we have some time for questions. Please step up to the microphone if you want to ask the speaker anything. Um, in the meantime, I, I might ask one. Yep. Um, so are there any other sparse computation problems that you think the optimizations that you found could also apply to beyond uh, point cloud inference? Uh, yeah, I think this is a very good question. I, I would say that one of the problem I heard is like the racked tensor computation in, in one of the presentation today, I think, uh, it is potentially also possible for us to have the adaptive grouping. And for the memory access pattern, I think this might also be a very good optimization for like rough problems. Yep. Thanks.